Welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Tonight's show is about writing. Specifically, we're going to talk about some specialized alphabets linguists use for writing human languages, and then we'll talk briefly about ways of writing some Oklahoma Indian languages. First, I'd like to show you the International Phonetic Alphabet. Let me tell you a little bit about it first. This is a system for writing, uh, this is called, in the, in the phonetic parlance, this is called transcribing, for transcribing any human language. It was invented by the International Phonetic Association, uh, which was founded in France in 1886. Their alphabet was, in, was made official, I think, in 1888. It's used by phoneticians, and phoneticians are linguists who specialize in the study of language sounds. The International Phonetic Alphabet, or IPA, um, used to be used in the journal of the International Phonetic Association. All of their articles were written in IPA, whatever uh, language uh, the article was written in. It was all transcribed into IPA. They no longer do that. They now publish in, in uh, just English spelling. But I thought that was an interesting exercise. Um, the IPA is a scientific tool that allows the user, who is trained in its use, of course, um, to read and write any language using the system. Because the alphabet is supposed to contain enough symbols to represent any spoken language on Earth, um, you should be able to read and write any, the sounds of any language using this alphabet. And it pretty much does work that way. But on rare occasions, the I, IPA has needed to be updated um, to accommodate a sound which was found in a language and had not previously been known by scholars to exist. The last such revision that I'm aware of was in 1989, when a symbol for a linguolabial sound occurring in a few South Pacific languages was added. I think they sounded something like bleh. <laughs> you actually touched your tongue to your lip. And to that time, no one had known that any language used such a sound. When they found out that the sound that was needed to transcribe those languages, then they added a symbol for it to the IPA. The IPA is the standard system used by phoneticians all over the world. It's helpful in their field because it allows them to send language samples back and forth as they're doing research. And to know that the phonetician at the other end of the communication will be able to understand at a glance how a word or a phrase is pronounced just by looking at the transcription in IPA. The great thing is that every symbol is pronounced in one and only one way, and every sound is spelled in one and only one way when you use IPA. The name for this principle is one sound, one symbol. Very different from English spelling, for instance, where we have a letter C that's sometimes pronounced like a K, sometimes like an S. Um, a sound like S that's sometimes spelled with an S, sometimes with a C. You know, there's not that one-to-one -one correspondence. So there's an advantage to that. In addition, because the IPA keeps a running tally of all the sounds currently believed to be used by any human language, um, it's also useful to theoretical phoneticians who try to study uh, why human languages use the sounds they do. For instance, why is it common to find <clears throat> a sound you can think of as a V sound, and, and we do use that symbol in IPA. Um, why is that common? That's a sound made by contact between the upper teeth and lower lip, like this. Mm, v, verve. You put your upper teeth to your lower lip. So why is that common? Uh, occurs in many languages, and yet it's unheard of for any language to put the lower teeth to the upper lip, <laughs> making a sound like this. V, v. I guess it would sound kind of like v. No language, as far as we know, uses that. Therefore, there's no symbol for it in the IPA. So. Um, People who are studying this kind of theory look at the IPA, they say, well, gee, what are the sounds in, the, in, the, in human languages, and why is it just this list and not some other theoretically possible list? That would be an interesting question to answer. It would tell us something about the human brain and the human language capacity and why it works the way it does. So let's look at the IPA. Let me go to my chart here. I hope we get, are able to get a good shot of this. You might not be able to read all of the symbols, but this will give you some idea, at least, of what the array of sounds is. There are, I forget the exact number of total symbols, certainly several dozen. And they are arranged according to the way the sounds are made and where they're made in the mouth. Um, there are a few other principles here, too. All of this chart is about consonants. This one is diacritics. The vowels are represented over here. And there are some, um, some other diacritic type marks listed down here. The main ones we'll pay attention to tonight, just to keep things a little bit simpler, are the consonants and the vowels. Um, let's see. By the way, this chart, <clears throat> this chart of the IPA is available, along with a discussion of the sounds and some sample transcriptions using IPA in a booklet that's published uh, by, um, it's, the name of the booklet is Principles of the International Phonetic Association, published by the International Phonetic Association. And it's available from the Phonetics Department at University College London. 
I wouldn't be surprised if it was available off the internet these days too. I'm not sure if it is. Um, most linguistics students get a copy of this manual uh, during their first course in phonetics as they, as they uh, study linguistics. So this is the chart that sort of sums it all up. Um, as I said, it's arranged by um, not only whether something is a consonant or a vowel, but other details of how the sounds are made. So for instance, all the sounds in this column are made at the front of the mouth. They are bilabial, made with two lips, like p and b. Also, m, made with two lips. It's a nasal bilabial sound. And there are others as you go on down. There's a bilabial fricative in some languages, like Japanese. Japanese word for mattress is futon. And that's a bilabial. It's sort of an F-like sound, but it doesn't involve the teeth. It involves the two lips. So that's in the bilabial column. Next, we have labiodental sounds, like the V that I mentioned. Dental sounds made around the teeth. Alveolar sounds made behind the teeth. Post-alveolar, a little bit farther back. Retroflex sounds, Indian languages, languages of India, are known for these sounds, like t and d. Um, uh, what are you doing today would be how that sentence would sound if I were making all of my T's retroflex. And there's a slightly different symbol if you have a retroflex T. Palatal sounds, velar sounds like K and G in English, and ch, a velar fricative in German. Uvular sounds like the uh, of uh, some Eskimo languages of uh, Inupiat, I believe, and Yupik, I believe, both have that Q. Pharyngeal sounds, uh, Arabic is most famous for these, kind of a ha huh and a ha, huh, <laughs> way down in the throat. And finally, glottal sounds made at your glottis, where your vocal cords are in your throat. Um, there's the glottal stop, which we'll mention briefly later, and then there are two varieties of H's. As far as vowels, we have high vowels like E, low vowels like A, uh, middle vowels like U uh, and A uh, and A. Uh. Back vowels like U and U, uh, O and A, uh, A uh and A, uh and A uh and A. Uh. <laughs> so these are sort of arranged as if there were a picture of the face here, and this was the back of your mouth, and these were your lips up this way, and this was the roof of your mouth and the bottom of your mouth, where, where your tongue is at, at its lowest point. Uh, so that gives you an idea of what the IPA is. Now we'll talk some more um, in more detail about articulation in a later show. <clears throat> For now, let's just look at a few of the more commonly used symbols and see how they're used. <clears throat> um, if you noticed in that chart, a lot of the symbols that we're familiar with from the writing of English and other European languages are used there. Um, just a historical note on this. Uh, there are a number of other um, odd-looking symbols, too, that won't be so familiar to you. But the reason that it, it developed this way is that, um, well, for one thing, there are just too many sounds that need to be represented by a symbol for the alphabet of any single European language to handle it. So you can't write all the languages of the world just using the English alphabet. It, it can't be done, um, or the French, or the Italian, or anything like that. Um, the IPA, remember, was invented by European scholars in France, um, and their background as far as language study was mostly with English, French, German, Danish. These are the languages they were most, fam most familiar with. Um, Romance languages like Spanish, French, and Italian, Germanic like German, English, and Danish. Um, they also borrowed, so they used symbols from these languages first as being sort of, they felt that that was a common, common ground, I think, among students of languages, that they would all be familiar with at least some of these symbols from these languages. They also borrowed symbols from Greek when necessary, and they have in, invented a few new symbols that didn't exist in any alphabet. So I don't think this, um, this sort of a European looking aspect of the IPA really indicates any bias. It's just sort of an accident of history, the history of its development um, and the time and place when it was invented. The alphabet truly can be used to describe any human language, and this has been demonstrated now for decades. Let's look at a few samples of how the IPA is used to transcribe <coughs> different languages. Let me go back here. Let's see. Actually, let me just put these aside for a moment. And I'll write a little bit. First, just to sort of orient you to the vowels, these are the most unfamiliar uh, symbols in simple IPA transcription, I think, to the average English user anyway. <clears throat> let's look at some examples from English. And let's take, if you think of English as having the vowels A, E, I, O, U. Actually, I'll write those symbols, but English has many more vowels than that. But I'll show you how these symbols, which are all used in IPA, would, would be used to transcribe an English word. This A, this rounded A letter, is always used for the sound ah in IPA. So an example from English would be spelled like this. 
This has a number of interesting aspects to this spelling. You don't have to uh, feel that you need to grasp all the details right now. This little mark means uh, emphasize or accent this first syllable, the one that the syllable that follows the little mark. First syllable is F A, Fa. F is pronounced just as it is in English. The second syllable is Ther. This is a, sound, a consonant symbol that we'll talk about in a minute for the the sound. And this funny looking upside down thing is the er syllable. But what I'm trying to pay attention to, first of all, is vowels. So we've got father. Other words spelled with that um, would be like the word cot. I'll just write the English spelling on some of these to show the contrast. The word cot would be spelled with a K. Like I said, C is sort of ambiguous in English. So we just use K in IPA for the K sound. And the ah, same vowel, and a T on the end. The consonants are pretty familiar in that one. Um, and just if you want to write like the word ah, um, ah, sorry. I'm going to put quotes here like an ah, oh, you're here. That would just be that vowel ah. And if you're really drawing it out, ah, you can put a little colon on the end to indicate that that's a longer vowel than usual. Uh, let's look at some A examples. We've got cake. So the letter E is always pronounced A in IPA. And in this word cake, you have two Ks there. They're actually not identical. The first one is more breathy, or as we say in phonetics, aspirated. So you can put a little H here if you're doing a very narrow or detailed transcription. Um, other words with the vowel A, way, hey. Let's see how they would be spelled. You could say uh, way as in how much do you weigh, be spelled like this. Hay as in make hay while the sun shines, would not be spelled with an A-Y, but again with the E. Because these all have the same vowel sound. Don't think about the spelling, the traditional spelling in English, just the sound. Cake has an A, way has an A, hay has an A. So cake, way, and hay would be spelled like that. The letter I is used for the sound uh, E. So some examples for that would be the word free. F, I'm writing my R's upside down for a reason that I'll get to in a moment. It's kind of an upside down R. That's the American English style R, er, as opposed to R or R. Uh, free, so there's that vowel E. Uh, some other examples would be me and peace. Me, as in who, me, <laughs> would be spelled like that phonetically in phonetic transcription using IPA. And peace, as in a piece of cake, or as in give me peace, not war, both would be spelled the same way because they're both pronounced the same way. And again, all these words have the E sound, free, me, peace. So they're all spelled with the same letter in IPA. For the letter O, that's sort of like what you think of as a long O in English. So the word foam would be F-O-M. And actually, again, if you're being detailed and doing a very narrow transcription, you can put a little N in the air here, which indicates that this O is a little bit nasalized because of the following M. Uh, foam, let's see what other examples we have. Host, a host of sins, H-O-S-T, happens to be spelled as in English. But then take a word that rhymes with that, like toast, and this, it would be spelled in the same way in IPA, except for that first consonant, toast. The, uh, the U, this it represents a kind of long U sound, an U. And examples from English would be the name Luke, cool hand Luke, L-U-K. And another example would be food, F-U-D. So it takes a little getting used to the fact that uh, symbols are used differently than they are in English. But it's actually quite useful because things are not ambiguous as they are in traditional English spelling. You never have to look up a word and see how you would spell it in IPA. If you can hear the word, you can spell it. And if you can see an IPA transcription on a page, you always know exactly how to pronounce it. Because one sound, one symbol. Every letter is pronounced in just one way. So that's very useful in the study of sounds of language. Let's look at a few consonants from English. Very easily recognized ones. I'm just going to give you some more examples now that you're a little bit used to the vowels. This would be the word, and I'll put for completeness, I should put my accent mark here. This would be baby. An A vowel here and an E vowel there, baby. The B is very just used as in English. The name Pete, spell like that. So this is just to illustrate some easy consonants that are used very much as in English. C's, the seven C's. We use two S's here in English, but in IPA, those two sounds really are not the same. So we're going to spell it that way with a Z on the end. Because you don't say cease. That's a different word. That's this word, right? You say cease, but this word cease would have two S's in IPA. And so you can distinguish pronunciations in a much more methodical and scientific way using IPA than using traditional English spelling, which is full of exceptions and so forth. Let's look at a few. These are common consonants that are easy. Let's look at some where we need a special symbol to represent English sounds. How about the word shall? We spell that sh with an SH in English. In IPA, it has this rather exotic, long, long uh, cursive looking S. 
And then that second vowel is spelled like this. We didn't talk about all of the vowels yet of English, as I told you. That a is not kind of a and e smushed together. And the l is used as in English. So that's the word shall. Cherry also has something special. That ch sound, in English we spell it with a ch. In IPA we use this same symbol preceded by a t. Ch. If you try to say t and sh close together, you'll find out that the combination really is what a ch represents. Cherry. And this vowel is written like this. The accent's on the first syllable. We have that same R, and we have the E vowel on the end. This upside down R symbol is used for the er-like sound of American English. For instance, um, in English we say the word V-E-R-Y. We say very, er, in the middle. A British person, or a lot of British people, will say something more like very. And that r, that little flat uh, R in the middle, is written with an upright R symbol like that. It doesn't have a little post like that, which is reserved for another sound. But um, anyway, this is just to give you an idea. I want, I want to give you a chance to see a few more words. Uh, two more special symbols for consonants. That we have two words that are very similar in English, thin and then. They both are spelled with TH in English, but they don't start with the same sound, in fact. Thin will come out like this. This is where we, one example where we're using a Greek letter to represent, to make a distinction that English, for instance, can't make. So this is the th symbol theta, that's th. And then this vowel, this sort of short i sound, is written with a capital. Actually, there's two ways this one can be written. I should write it more strict IPA, which is like this, a, an i without a dot. Sorry, I'm kind of mixing two systems here. I, and then n, the n is just as in English. But then does not start with a theta. It starts with, we use another Greek letter for this one. Or actually, that's an old English letter, sorry. Uh, sometimes called ev, and then, thin and then. Then, let's say, has a vowel something like uh, this one, something like the vowel of cherry, then, and it ends in an n. So th can be spelled in two ways, depending on which kind of English th you're talking about. So the IPA transcription is more informative as to what the sounds of English are than English spelling itself is. And that's one reason why this stuff is so, so useful to people who are studying the sounds of languages. Um, let me move to another language now, just give you a few real simple examples from French, Spanish, and Comanche. Let's erase this very familiar English, get to something a little less predictable, at least for some viewers, I suppose. Okay, um, Spanish examples. Um, <laughs> If you want to say, give me a dollar in Spanish, it'll be spelled like this in traditional Spanish orthography. Dame un dólar. In IPA, it comes out like this. Accent on the first syllable, so we put our mark here. A vowel again, like in father. Da, me. A, like in cake. Dame. Un. U, long U type sound. N, as before. There might be a little nasalization there that we could mark. Dólar would be... D, O, accent on the first syllable, L, dolar. I think probably this is where we would use this R symbol, the kind of sound of uh, Spanish. It's sort of like that British R that I was talking about in Vedi. You say pero, meaning but. You know, um, I'm sick, but I'm managing. <laughs> a lot of people have the flu lately. Versus perro, a dog. So the transcription of these, uh, the IPA transcription, the word for but would be probably like this, I would think. Pero. Pero. But perro dog would be like this. And this is where you use the more normal looking R. That's that trilled R. Perro. So we have pero and perro. And you can distinguish those two. You can actually distinguish them in Spanish spelling too. But other languages distinguish them in other ways. So it's good to have this universal system to distinguish those two types of sound, the trilled and non-trilled R versus the American R, which, you know, as I said before, is the upside down one. That's the er. Uh, let's, let me give you a couple more from Spanish, and then we'll look at French. In Spanish, the word for bird is ave, spelled like this traditionally. In IPA, this is where we're going to need to get some additional symbols, which we haven't had to use for English yet. In IPA, this is going to be written like this. This is another uh, symbol taken from Greek called beta. Accents on the first syllable, ave. This v, v thing that's written with a V in Spanish is not pronounced like an English V. It's a bilabial fricative. It's v as opposed to v. It's v, ave. 
So we write it with that symbol, um, which also occurs in words like the word for glass, spelled like this traditionally. But IPA would be like this. Whoops, beta again. Lasso. And what else have we got? And then another, another word, borro, that's got that trilled R, so we'll get some more practice with that. Borro, spelled like this traditionally, and also in English, by coincidence. In IPA, you would transcribe it like this. Uh, borro, sorry, made a mistake already. I need my beta. Borro, it's not really a B like in English, it's a V. Borro, and a trilled R, and an O. You tend to use fewer letters <laughs> than you do sometimes in the European languages, in IPA. Um, OK, so that's Spanish. Let's take a look at a few examples from French. Let's take some more familiar words. Cité, as in Ile de la Cité, means something like city, which it's related to. I don't know if that's the best translation, but it's spelled that way in French with an accent mark here for some curious reason that has to do with French use of accents. But in IPA, it would be spelled like this, cité. And here are the accents on the second syllable, so we'll put our little raised mark here. Cité, il de la cité, cité. Um, état, as in the state. L'état c'est moi, said Louis XIV. The state, that's me. It's spelled like this traditionally in French. In IPA, it'll be a, t, a. Just three letters, état, accented on the second syllable. And let's see, aujourd'hui, very long word that means today. It's spelled in a very complicated way, traditionally, in French. In IPA, it has a lot less letters. O, which is this part, spelled with the letter O. J, here's a special symbol we haven't seen yet. This is one of the invented symbols I think the IPA creators made. It's not a Z, but a J. O, jour, ur. Mm, I think we might use this uh, special French R there, capital. Dui, aujourd'hui, and the accents on the last syllable. Um, let me see. We need a couple more special ones for French. The word eggs, spelled like this traditionally. There's a special symbol for that vowel, e, the O and E smushed together, and that's all. All these other letters in French are, are silent, so in IPA, that's just e. It's just a simple vowel, that word for eggs. Municipal like this traditionally, would be spelled with another special symbol, a letter Y used in a certain way. It's a front rounded vowel, U, not U, but U. Mu, ni, si, pal. Municipal, accent on the last syllable as it usually is in French. So those are some examples from those languages. Let's look at a little bit of uh, Native American languages next. Start with Comanche. How much time do I have left now? About four minutes. Okay, we're going to have to rush through some of it. Well, we'll see. We'll see how we go. Um, Comanche. Now, Comanche, of course, is an Indian language of Oklahoma. And there's a, it's a language that happens to have um, two different words for grandmother, depending on whether it's on your mother's or your father's side. The maternal grandmother is called kaku. When you call her, you say kaku, with the accent on the second syllable. But if you're talking about my grandmother did such and such, it's nakaku. And it's very simple to spell with very familiar symbols, just K sounds and an A vowel and an U vowel, kaku. But if you call her, it's kaku. <laughs> and we probably make an extra long U on that one, and then we accent the second syllable. Um, more examples from Comanche, the word for skunk, which means something like stinker. <laughs> It's pronounced pisuni. Pisu, accent on this last syllable. Ni, and a pretty long I there. Pisuni, that's the word for skunk. And a there's a common greeting. This is, uh, these are two words that will show unfamiliar symbols used in Comanche, unfamiliar to most people. There is a greeting written in Comanche alphabet like this. Uh, well, it can be written one, two ways, really, but usually like this. Maruagwe, it's pronounced like this. Maru, that's that R like the, like the single non-trilled R of Spanish. Maru, awe. So the accent's on this syllable right here, so we put the mark before that. Maruagwe, that's how you greet someone. Another way to greet someone is with the word that happens to be the same as the word for yes. It's spelled like this in Comanche orthography, but 
in IPA, we're going to have to put something special here that we haven't seen yet, and that is some kind of marker that indicates that vowel is nasalized. You don't just say ha, you say ha, kind of a little bit through your nose. So that tilde, which you may be familiar with from Spanish, is used to mark a vowel as nasalized. Um, let me just mention, too, that this is not the only way. I want to get this, this point in because we may run out of time, and I may not be able to cover everything I wanted to get to. This is not the only way that people have transcribed American Indian languages. There have been different systems that people have used. As I said, IPA is pretty much the international standard. But there are several uh, symbols that are sometimes written differently in the American linguistic tradition for some reason, like the CH sound, uh, the, word for chain, the word chain in English. Uh, according to IPA, would be written with that ch and an a and an n, maybe a little nasal mark to show that the vowel is a little bit nasal too. But there's an alternate way of making that ch sound, which is a C with a little what's called a hat check over it, in which case you would spell it like this, chain. So ch versus ch, they mean the same thing, it's just some people prefer one symbol over the strict IPA symbol, which is this column here. Uh, another kind of alternation is in the sh type sound, as in the English word shoot. Uh, in IPA, it would be like this. Some Americanists will use it like this, though, the S with the hat check over it. Shoot. And beige. Now, some people in English pronounce this beige, but if you have that je sound in it, in IPA, that would be pronounced, uh, that would be transcribed with this Z with the tail on it. Uh, in the Americanist system, sometimes you see, again, the hat check over the Z to indicate the je sound. Judge, similar case. Uh, strict IPA, you would go, oh, sorry, you would write the D and the J together to make J. And there's the vowel U uh, and another D, another J there. Some Americanists, though, will use the J with the hat check, so they would go like this. And one other, there's one vowel symbol that also tends to vary, as in the English word book. In IPA, we haven't seen this one yet because we didn't go through all the vowels, but in IPA, the English word book would be written like this. This sort of fondly known as the butt print among some linguists. <laughs> There's an alternate symbol that some American linguists especially like to use, which is sometimes fondly known, fondly known as the bucket. It goes kind of like this. So you can transcribe book that way. This is the strict IPA, and this is a, I'll mark it USA. It's a kind of, some American linguists prefer this. So for that reason, when, when American linguists have helped people develop alphabets, sometimes you see this set of consonant and vowel symbols as used in the IPA, the strict IPA. Sometimes you'll see the symbols in the second column, the ch, sh, zh, j, and uh. So some of these symbols will show up in different alphabets, depending on the preference of whoever advised people as to how to develop an alphabet for their language. It's interesting. I'll see you next time on WordPad. <laughs> Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma da wole kita. Na hene yo hene.